This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being. Being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. According to the shamanic way of viewing the world, one of the major causes of illness is soul loss. When we are disconnected from ourselves through trauma, soul loss, illness, and our pain, we cut away at our inner landscape and we disconnect from the earth. We fear nature, we hurt nature, and we become unaware of our footprint upon the earth. Valerie Atelli's interview Samantha Corey, a shamanic practitioner, spiritual healer, facilitator of sacred healing space and speaker. Over Samantha Corey's life, she has been referred to as a shamanic practitioner, a spiritual healer, a medicine woman, a soul sister, a facilitator of sacred healing space, a storyteller, a wise woman, a mentor, and a meditation teacher. However, above all, she is a mama to two twin boys, a lover of the ocean, and a self-confessed tea-aholic. Through earth-based and shamanic healing techniques and journeying, guided visualization, soul retrieval, storytelling, breath techniques, and a plethora of other skills, Samantha energetically walks with her clients and students as they weed their soul's garden, befriend the dragon, unearth their inner sacred sites, welcome home lost and fragmented soul parts, and ultimately come home to the truth that lives in their heart. She offers face-to-face -face healing and mentoring sessions outside in nature, or phone or Zoom consultations with interstate and overseas clients. Meet Samantha at samanthacorey.com.au. Here's the interview with Samantha Corey. In your own words, who is Samantha Corey? <laughs> Samantha Corey is a, a mama of twins first, um, a, a self-confessed teaholic and a lover of the ocean. I'm passionate about nature and what I love, who I am is, I suppose it's easy to say I'm me, but it take, when I say that it takes in all my flaws and all my qualities and it bundles it up in a beautiful package that I'm presenting to you today. I love that. And is taking everything, not, I mean, including everything when we talk about ourselves as life itself. And as I mentioned earlier, we start to um, have a conversation around unconditional love. Is that something that, that's what you mean when you, you say taking everything that you are, the flaws, the beauty, is that what we are here to do? Sam, to love unconditionally? Oh, yes, yes, I believe so. So I, when I work with my clients, I write the word love going down. So if you wrote it um, vertically, L-O-V-E, L would be love, O would be our, V would be vulnerable, E would be emotions. So I believe that when we love unconditionally, we not only love the world and animals and everybody, and we're, we're all connected, you know, brothers and sisters, we are all one. I feel as though when we love unconditionally, we love our emotions and we love the vulnerable and the hurting part as well. Because when we can love that in ourselves, I believe that we can be, we can be um, true pillars for other people. And, and for the world in general. How do we learn to love, per se, or accept our anger, 
our jealousy, our hatred. I mean, the emotions of that. that yeah, yeah. Right. We have I, a name for it, but it's just emotions really rising. Absolutely. Absolutely. When I, when I work with people, I, um, I say to them, they're, they're the emotions that knock on your window at two o'clock in the morning and keep you awake. They're the emotions that come when you're sitting by yourself with, with the television off and the music off and you're afraid to sit by yourself because those emotions come up. But they're, they're just friends, you know. They're just friends that have been ignored because of culture or society or um, religion or because of really bad trauma. And so we, we've been told we can't be angry or we can't cry and we have to hold back those tears. And I, I believe that they're, they're pathways to a beautiful island that holds treasure. And every, I believe that every emotion has an opposite. So the opposite of hate is love. The opposite of, of anger is peace. And, and that there's an opposite. It's like a coin. You know, so if we if we understand what the treasures are that that emotion is holding, then we can slowly breathe out. So another analogy could be, it's another analogy is is a dragon. You know, we're, we're taught to fight the dragon and kill the dragon and, and and slay the dragon. It's it's in all the myths and and fairy tales. But I encourage people and myself to to approach the dragon, take off my armor and look the dragon in the eye and give the dragon its name. So let's name let's name it. Let's say it's anger or let's say it's hatred or jealousy. And then that dragon can slowly start to not be so fearful or angry or fire its fiery, you know, smoke at us. Then it can show us what it's what it's holding and um, keeping in the cave. Because dragons, you know, dragons hold treasure. And when we can talk to our dragon and name our dragon, it can show us the treasures that it's protecting from us. Because when we're angry, we can't see compassion and we can't see how good we are. We, we, we degrade ourselves and, and we chop out, you know, um, we, uh, we fell out in a forest. But when we can name what it is, then we can stop chopping out in a forest and we can feel confident and we can feel empowered and we can love ourselves more. I noticed that this might be the most challenging kind of suffering or pain that we go through as human beings. I mean, besides grief, that seems to be like a tough one. But the negative emotions and the negative thoughts, yeah, I think it seems like everyone's trying to escape from them and numb them and like you said just kind of slay the dragon and not really listen to it yeah what a wonderful invitation do you believe that it's something that is challenging hard to do or it just requires pausing quieting the mind and being quiet for a moment and listening it, i believe it requires both it requires being still and listening and it also requires courage and because those emotions may give, bring up memories that triggered the emotion in the first place. And that requires courage to say, I want to actually sit with that memory and then go deeper into the, the cause of that memory. And that, that requires a lot of courage and it requires maybe healing or whatever it is that people need to ha have someone hold that space so that they can feel that someone's walking with them through that dark tunnel, that they're not doing it alone. So I believe that it's, it's a bit of both. Let me ask you another question, Sam, about life itself. What is this? What is this experience of being in a human body? So the, for me, the experience of being in a human body is to feel, you know, feel really deeply and feel and have a sensual experience, to have a sexual experience, to have a loving experience to reach out and touch. I believe being in a physical body gifts us our five senses and it allows us to use our five senses in a way that opens the world in another way for us. If we were just a spirit being, that's a wonderful thing, but we also have chosen to come here. I believe we've chosen to come here um, for to experience life. 
to, to, to experience it in, with our senses, to experience it with somebody else, whether it's a friend or a lover or a family. And it's also, I believe, to have a, a physical body is to, is to be conscious now of what your footprint is upon the earth and how, how you can choose to walk upon the earth. Do we choose to walk with anger or do we choose to walk with love? And what we choose to do will, will affect the next seven generations to come. And it will affect all those ancestors that we have. So being in, being someone in a physical body, you know, is, is fun, is exciting, but it also has a responsibility. How did you come to these understandings? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the journey of you. <laughs> the journey of me, the journey of me. Um, well, you know, the one way of saying it is, is I, you know, in 90, 1997, I had a car accident and got whiplash and the physio was a Reiki practitioner and took me all down that journey. So through healing my neck, I did a lot of spiritual healing. Then I did lots of other courses, shamanic courses, and I traveled and that's, that's the easy way of answering the question. But the other way that I'll answer is because I, you know, I went into my deep tunnels and I, I sat with my dragon and I woke up when the knocking on the window woke me up and I, I sat in my darkness. That's the deeper question. That's the deeper answer. And that's, that, that's the true answer as well because that's taken me on many, on many roads and it's, it's led me to realize that I'm an active participant in this healing and for me to follow my path, which is to be a healer and a, a, a shamanic practitioner, I have to do the work as well. And that makes me be able to sit deeply with my clients and, and hold the space for them when they want to get angry or, or full of grief. Yeah. What a wonderful message to sit with our dragons, with the darkness, without fear, having the courage to do that. And that brings me to the question of healing. Do you believe that healing has a destination or this is an ongoing process? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's an ongoing process. I believe that it may it will continue to go in this lifetime until we take our final breath. And even that is is healing. Because how how we die, I believe will will help those that are still living and so it, it continues it's it's a continual journey you know sometimes we pause sometimes we go okay we've had enough now please let's just stop and I can't like I know for me there's times where you know I can't do any and I'm in inverted commas spiritual things you know I'm not meditating per se and I'm not doing you know working with clients but you know, I'm still collecting water and I'm still chopping wood and I'm still yeah. chopping vegetables. <laughs> yeah. And it's that that is still spiritual. You know, we don't have to always sit on the top of a mountain by ourselves in a yogic position. Do, doing healing like that, it, it's how we, how we talk to the person, you know, who's just given us, who's served us our vegetables. It's how we walk past the you know, the, the homeless person that's still doing the work, you know. I yeah. love that, yeah, bringing to down to earth, to the ordinary, right, and not always looking for extraordinary experiences to... Oh, the, yeah, the ordinary, the ordinary is so extraordinary. If we, if we can be mindful in our yes, day-to-day life. Yeah, I believe that. So uh, let me ask you another question about spirituality. How do you define spirituality these days? If you were to describe what that is, I know you just said a lot there, which resonates with me. <laughs> but if you were to give a description or um, let's say define spirituality, what would you say? Um, I would define spirituality by, by connecting to your heart and living from your truth. So when we, when we really live our truth, I believe we really connect to our heart because our heart, I believe it's, it's, you know, when we connect to our truth, we connect to our heart, but our heart will only ever speak our truth. And however, we get lost in self-sabotage and we get lost in, in, um, the doing 
as opposed to the being. And we get lost with all the, um, I need to have that and I need to have this to try and be better, you know, it's greener on the other side of the, the fence. But we, we have our own journey and our own journey is so unique. There is nobody else in the world like you or me or anybody, you know, everyone is so unique. And that unique journey is the spirituality because if that person wasn't part of that, that um, the fabric of life, that the patchwork of life, that, that part would be taken out and there would be a hole there. So we all have such an important part to play just by being ourselves and by living our absolute truth. Would you say that the only truth that exists is our truth or there is a ultimate truth? So our truth keeps us on the path of what we need to do in the world. Like, so our, our truth keeps us on the path of our, our vision, you know, our vision that's set out if you believe in God or whatever. It's, it's the path that sets us to do healing work or to be a teacher or to be a doctor or, or to be a mum or, or whatever that is. Um, and that's our own individual path. So our, our, if we stay on our path, that's our truth. How, I also believe that if we stay on our path, we're living the ultimate truth because the ultimate truth is, is for me about love, about peace, about caring for nature, about being compassionate, about being grounded and here, about being kind to, to all living things, you know, the, the small, and, and being, because I feel, I feel that when we live in fear, we, we hurt. We hurt people, we hurt nature, we hurt ourselves. When we live in love, then maybe love is the greatest mm. truth. Mm. Mm. Maybe that's what right. it is. Mm. Yeah, that resonates. Yeah, Love being the ultimate truth. And when we spoke about unconditional love earlier, that means accepting everything, not just parts of life. Yes, right? yes. So, that's exactly right. It's 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 accepting it's accepting nature. It's accepting um, ourselves, our, our loved ones. You know, people in the street. It doesn't exclude anything, right? No, and and it's hard when when people do things that we don't agree with. You know, there might be politicians who have different beliefs to us, or there might be ways that people interact in the world. So, it, you know, if we keep that our our um, path is is love and peace. Then that's the path that you know. That's the truth that we're spreading. It's like that's the that's the cornucopia that's coming out and of ourselves and and generating out to the world. I love that we can come from a place that's not personal. We are able to do that and see life itself as something that is happening as a gift, as a miracle to be here, to be in a human body, to be aware that we, we can have this conversation, that we can touch, that we can hear, talk. I mean, it's just, to me, amazing, this experience. It seems to me like we need to come from a place that's not personal because the moment we become this entity, this individual with all these ideas or belief systems, how this reality mm -hmm. should be, should mm -hmm. not be, <laughs> that's when everything becomes distorted, confused, in fear. I mean, that's separation, really. Yeah, yeah, t totally. I, and when we live in that, that should have and should be, we're, we're comparing. I should be doing this. I should, should have done that. It's, we're comparing and, and trying to analyze and... But if we come from a, a, a space of, okay, this is my path and my path is different to somebody else's and if we come from a space of pure love, no, that's so lovely. Every footstep is love. And, and it, it is. It's, it's greater than us. It's much greater than us, our humanness, because our humanness does have all those flaws. Yes, all these preferences. Yeah, I mean, it's good yeah. to feel good, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> It's not the only thing that's real, right, as we know. I mean, in this perspective, of course. I, I love asking the question about uh, what's real, what's not real. And then that's another conversation, I guess, we can have maybe in a different podcast <laughs> conversation. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Our feelings are real. <laughs> yes, they very much 
feel real. <laughs> Feelings, emotions, yeah, it's an interesting, yeah, wow. right. And then what I do, let me, uh, let, before I talk to you, I guess we're already talking about what do you do, which is this clearing, in a sense of clarity. You are open the way so we can see clearly ourselves and our, our path and the life itself, which is so, it's a beautiful thing, clarity. I love that oh, word mm-hmm. too. His mm-hmm. idea. When I think about this existence, we call existence life, uh, so many names for this reality, I think about a dream and how similar it is when we dream at night, that this is very similar. Like, I don't know how I got here. <laughs> I have no idea. But I take yeah. that as being real, <laughs> you know, what's happening. And I don't mm-hmm. question when I am in a dream, although I have had lucid dreams where it's kind of interesting to be awake and to kind of know that you are in a dream. Oh, I'm dreaming now. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in a way, I feel like this is what's happening. This is a dream. But not Mm. in the sense that's not real. It is the reality of the dream. So everything that's happening here, it arises naturally. It just happens to be unconditionally. I love the way you speak of love because that's what comes really. It's the only way to interpret this when you come from that place outside of a person that's unconditional. So I guess my question is, do you see a difference between the dreams that we have at night and what's happening now? For me, the dreams that we have at night are a stepping stone for where we are now. They they might be a, a premonition of what we have to do. They might be a a understanding deeper of our vision. They might be, you know, the, the dreams that sort things out and, and rearrange things. I feel that when we look at the dreams, it's like we're taking away the mist and we're seeing what is there to really see the next step in our path. In the way you see dreams, the ones we have at night as messengers in a way. Yes. Yeah, it's like a message being given. That's an interesting, yeah, and I have, of course I have kind of interpreted that way too, because I tend to see everything from a, this, they call it big picture of things. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, there's wider perspective. In the dream at night, it's like what I said before, we have no idea how we got there, like how that was Mm -hmm. born, the Mm -hmm. the beginning of it. And we don't know what's going Mm -hmm. to happen. We don't know even the next, what's going to happen next. And then something happens and we take that as real. Oh, this is what it is. So I'm wondering if this is also the same thing, but in a way it keeps going, like it's a dream within a dream. And then the next one now is whatever we give our attention to, maybe whatever we're focused here. This reality, because we have a body, so it's uh, much easier to focus on sensory perceptions and Mm. survivor and all that. And then after there's another dream starts, there might be something else. The focus might be something else. And then it keeps going without... Oh, I'm just kind of uh, <laughs> talking out loud with you, Sam, because yeah, I appreciate oh, the uh, this space yeah, to, uh, to talk about these things that we can only write about sometimes or talk to certain people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree and it's so it's so lovely to be able to have that space that you provide when when you interview people to allow the to allow those dreams to keep unfolding and you know you, you talk about it as a dream I see it as a cloak that keeps unfolding that keeps um opening out that becomes the the, the biggest patchwork ever that becomes maybe like a spider web that keeps weaving this beautiful sp- this beautiful web that we're all connected to, but we don't know how we're connected, but we're we're still there. You know, we're still part of this. We're still part of the, you know, the patchwork of life, but, you know, you're over there in New York and I'm here in Sydney and and how we got together is part of this dream, this overall dream Mm. of, oh, we're Mm -hmm. here right now. (laughs) And and this space right now, you know, Uh is so explicit. (laughs) But how we... There, you know, I, I was floored how we got there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. And then it becomes even more interesting when you lose this idea or this grasp on, on wanting to know how I got here. So I, now I'm just here and this is, wow, this is interesting. <laughs> and wow, it, it feels different. Or how, how, whatever arises, we just kind of take that in without wanting to know. I know that this is a... It seems to be a very uncomfortable place for most of us, the unknown, 
This is the unknown, isn't it? All of this here right now. It's unknown oh, to absolutely. me. absolutely. Yeah. Totally, totally. Absolutely. Everything is the unknown, but it seems like we have come to that state of separation where now we want to know. There's a lot of knowing happening with human beings, right? And that's where, to me, it seems like that's where suffering really comes from. The wanting to know everything, explaining everything away. And it takes us out of the present moment. Right. When we try it. Yeah, yeah, because this is the magic. This is the impossible, yeah. I call it. It's completely the impossible. <laughs> I'm like, what's, how can I, how, that's just, <laughs> I mean, I cannot even conceive this. Like one of these days I asked myself, what are you doing? Like, who are you? And yeah. what are you doing here? And then the answer was, you're not. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And that, yeah, and I could ex- it's not even experience, it's an insight. It's like you're not. Yeah, hmm. yes, yes. Oh my God, Sam, we'll go on and on forever on this. <laughs> Talk to me about um, soul loss and soul retrieval. On your website, I found this really mm-hmm. insightful. You say, according to the shamanic way of viewing the world, one of the major causes of illness is soul loss. When we are disconnected from ourselves through trauma, so loss, illness, or and or pain, we cut away at our inner landscape and we disconnect from the earth. Mm-hmm. I interviewed a couple of people about soul retrieval, mm-hmm. and you, I think, are my third one. So talk to me about your perspective. How would you describe that experience? So for me, before I was on, before I did um, any healing, particularly shamanic healing, and before I understood what soul loss was. I, you know, I was traveling the world, you know, as in being in the world and I was being the best person I could possibly be. However, when I had soul retrievals, I realized, oh, those parts of me were missing because of different things in my life. And when I got them back, I was like, oh, this is how I am in the world because I've got that piece back. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. So you've got all these beautiful pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, but sometimes Something happens and pieces go under the table and they get lost and you're trying to put the the puzzle together, but there's missing pieces. And you can do the most beautiful puzzle and have pieces missing and people will say to you, oh, where are those pieces? They don't necessarily always look at the, the beautiful work that you've done, but an authoritative is finding those pieces and putting them back and having someone with you. So another analogy that I use is we have this exquisite basket that lives inside us. And with life, our basket becomes frayed and it becomes torn and it ends up having dirt inside it. And a soul retrieval is is being in a space where you can have someone hold your basket and gently weave it back for you. And it's not me doing the weaving. I'm I facilitate the space for your guides to weave. And for you to find the pieces to put back in. And your heart, your your basket lives in your heart. And when your basket's frayed, that's how your heart feels. It feels that you can't love fully. It feels that you can't connect fully. It feels that you might have um, low energy. And, and trauma is different to everybody. Trauma for one person could be the first day of school. Trauma for somebody else could be war and post-traumatic stress syndrome because of, you know, because of abuse and things like that. And it's so different. And because of the nature of people's trauma, it's how the basket will be frayed. And it's gently helping people reweave that basket. Because when we have a, our basket is woven, you know, I keep talking about treading lightly upon the earth. But when we, when we are fully back, we we under we connect better with the earth. When we're disconnected, when our basket is frayed, we we fear because we don't have strength in us, so we fear. We we don't have love in us because we fear. We don't have self self empowerment. And and when we start getting those qualities back, then you know, then we become this beautiful light that's that can radiate stronger our light bulb as a lighthouse can be 
you know, a thousand watts instead of 10 watts. On your site, you say you call it actually feeling fragmented and separated from life. That's what comes to me every time. We are life itself. So why do we feel separated? It seems like we have claimed ownership of a piece of reality, just a piece of life, like call me, and then we just hold on to it. This is me, this is my, that's what I believe in. No one can try to change what I believe or what I feel or know to be true. And that's when mm -hmm. it had been my case. And I'm not sure if we can really change all that. From your experience, were you with your clients too? Are you able to feel less of the separation or you know how to navigate those waters per se better <laughs> and dance a much better dance <laughs> with the all these forces <laughs> yeah well I love I love the word dancing and and the and being on the boat because sometimes you know sometimes we I believe that we're constantly on a boat right, and sometimes right, right. the ocean is really right. calm and it's beautiful and really, we're really peaceful. Right. But, but nature's not like that all the time. <laughs> right, yeah. You know, yes. nat nature gives big waves and there's <laughs> yes. storms. And, and that's true for us. We, we can't always be calm. We always have, you know, there's always a, some kind of wind that's coming up because we've been triggered. or And, and what that does that allows us to dance it out to change our dance so that we we, we don't we're not lying to ourselves okay I, I want to be peaceful but I'm feeling really angry mm -hmm. I want to be peaceful <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> so then we've got to then we've got to do the anger dance you know then we've got to go okay I can't navigate this ship the way I'm navigating it because I'm in really high seas and, and I have to change the way the sails are so, so I feel being being here is constantly allowing us to change our reality because I believe nature is our greatest teacher, and that nature is always moving. Nature is always showing us about life, death, and rebirth. The seas are always changing. The skies are always changing, and it's an invitation for us to constantly change and to constantly evolve and to allow the dead wood to fall, to allow spring to come, to allow ourselves to go inward and feel naked in the, the, um, the vulnerability of no leaves on our tree so that we can go in our inner cave so that then when spring comes, we can, we can take that breath out and go, oh, okay, so this is what it means. But unless we go in, we can't come out again. Beautifully said. Yeah, beautifully Put. I love the way you give nature as a reference for the human life and movement and how graceful it is, yeah, nature. Through all these seasons, those chains, it's just so grateful and flexible, right, Sam? Yes, absolutely. We, it, one, of the, one of the greatest things we can do, and I think it's one of the hardest things, is to be both flexible and adaptable. Flexible like the wind, the wind against the trees, you know, if we're not flexible, you know, we break and adaptable water is adaptable. It can, it can go into any form, you know, it can go down waterfall, it can go into a cup. And when we can be flexible and adaptable in the right balance, oh, it's like we can breathe out. We're not <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love the breath you took too, <laughs> because it feels like that. Yeah. When we can do that. Yeah. I do call that the dance of life. Yeah. That's the dance. There's no other way, really. We either dance or become stagnated and just stuck, basically, which causes all the negative. It's not a cause for the negativity and the negative consequences, but it, it seems to be the root, the cause for them. They no longer flow, right, Sam, through us. That's, that's right. Mm, that's right. It, yeah. It's like a stagnant pool. You know, right. it, it goes really stale and, and, right. it, and that becomes us when we don't move. When we don't sit with our fear or our anger or our dragons or go through our tunnels or, or choose that, choose to dance it out or, or being the wind, we, be, we become stagnant. And that's, I feel that's where resentment comes and that's where anger builds up. It's like, okay, so I'm feeling like this, but I don't want to empty my cup because I'm really happy being angry. Okay. So it boils over like this cauldron. And so I... The work that I do with people is encourage them to, to take the lid off, 
and to say, okay, I'm angry today. Let, let me empty some of that cup of anger so I can see, all oh, right, okay, once I empty some of that, underneath is, you know, I've caught it anger, but actually underneath is loneliness or at the bottom of the cauldron is fear. Yeah. So it keeps it's unfolding. So, so yeah. Yeah. It keeps unfolding totally, totally, like, like nature. That's something that surprised me, that most of us don't see that, that we are nature, that we are not apart from nature. We are nature itself, too. Absolutely, yes. So you offer earth-based shamanic healing techniques and journey, and also guided visualization, soul retrieval, storytelling, breath techniques. Uh, that's wonderful. It always works, going back to the breath. Would you like to talk about any of these other methods, Sam, for a moment? Well, I, I suppose what I do is kind of what we've been doing now yeah. through, mm-hmm. through, through, through the pictures. You know, I, I share analogies and pictures and, and how people respond to that is very different because the picture is very different to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I facilitate beautiful workshops that are called Let's Talk About, where each six to eight weeks I propose a topic and we talk about anger or we talk about death or we talk about ancestors and we talk about the unspoken so that we can move it through our body. I, that, so that, that that's the group sessions that I do. And, you know, in one-on-one, essentially, I suppose what I do is help people find their sacred landscape inside, not by not by pulling the dead wood out or not by being unconscious to what it is. It's it's being really gentle to themselves so that they can weed their soul's garden and plant what it is that they want. Being really careful and gentle and and mindful that, you know, maybe this plant doesn't grow here, but it can grow over there. I don't need it here. So I I use a lot of analogies and I, I work either via Zoom or Skype with international clients to create a space so that people can come home to their heart through soul retrieval or through breath because I believe that everyone's garden is exquisite and it's just helping them be the best gardener they can be and finding the right things to put back in when when it's been lost. Thank you so much uh, for being here in this reality with this intention. It's really a beautiful thing. I don't usually use the word beautiful for almost anything else but nature. When I look at nature, the the grace and how it flows. But there are some human beings that resemble that. They they embody that, that Mm. nature. So you are one of them. Thank you again, Sam. Bless, Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. So before we... And our conversation today, I have a few more questions for you, the ending questions. Would you like to add anything? Um, Other than a thank you? No. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, no, I think I feel as though we've had a beautiful cup of tea together. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, right, right. I could taste it for sure. My last questions to you, let me see, let me ask you this one. I'll ask you two questions. What is another word for healing? Another word for healing would be, the word that came to me just then was mindfulness. And what are three things about life you know for sure as of this moment? I know that everything is changeable. I know that nature is my greatest teacher and grounds me when I'm feeling that I don't know where to go. And what else do I know right now? I, on a personal level, I know the love of my children fill my heart. Thank you so much again for your presence, clarity, wisdom, for this sincere desire to help yourself and others. It's really a beautiful thing. Thank you again, Sam. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your work, products, services, and future projects? Sure. So um, I've got a website. So it's Samantha Corey, S-A-M-A-N-T-H-A. C-O-R-R-I-E dot com dot A-U. And, and it's all there on the website. I, I do have a Facebook account and an Instagram account. Sam underscore Corey is Instagram and oh, Samantha underscore Corey is Instagram and it's the same for Facebook. I also do a, um, 
a, a free meditation every Tuesday night on Facebook just to offer people a space just to connect. I'll have your website link on your podcast profile too. Oh, perfect. Beautiful. Thank you so much again, Sam. And we'll talk soon. Bless you. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Samantha Corey and her work, please visit samanthacorey.com.au. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.